a few people go, yeah, but surely there's a boat that you, you get onto and you sleep on that and then you get back on the rowing boat. And I'm like, no. The first six miles, I was like, God, I've got this in the bag, you know? And then people always go, oh, what was the hardest bit of the third mile? And I always go, the last 24 miles. No one can go, you took the easy route, you know? And you know, you've got to work for them, you've got to get after them, but then, you know, the harder the battle, the sweeter the victory, they say. Jack, how are you, brother? Yeah, really good, Chris. Thank you um, so much for having me on. Absolute pleasure. It's um, uh, I'm just in awe of what you're uh, about uh, about to do. Um, so Jack Jarvis, Great. Jack Jarvis, our friends at home, a fellow commando, is going to be the first person to row from mainland Europe to mainland usa um jack just explain to us because obviously we've had um two atlantic or i should say two teams of atlantic rowers on the show um lee spencer who rode solo with uh, w- with one leg yeah i know lee spencer really good guy isn't it yes and he <laughs> smashed a load of records yeah have you seen his upcoming rec- uh, upcoming challenge Yes, he's going to do this. Is it the triathlon of Great Britain? Yeah, it's, it's mad. I was speaking to him the other day and he was like, I was like, mate, you've done enough fundraising, do you know what I mean? But no, he's a cool guy. Yes, that. I guess the issue there is, and it's going to be the issue with yourself, isn't it? If the currents are in your favour. Yeah, yeah. Um, a big one. So, so I'll tell everyone a little bit about the challenge. So like you said, First person to go from mainland Europe to mainland North America, non-stop, solo, unsupported. So that just means, you know, can't, can't um, stop anywhere. So in the Canaries or, you know, in the Caribbean on my way to North America, unsupported means once I set off from Portugal, that is me completely on my own. A few people go, yeah, but surely there's a boat that you, you get onto and you sleep on that and then you get back on the rowing boat. And I'm like, no. I'm on that boat. I can't so much as take a Mars bar off a sailing boat if, if I pass one. Um, and obviously people sometimes get um, mixed up. People have obviously rode the Atlantic solo like Lee Spence, but we just did different routes. So Lee Spence went from mainland Europe to South America. Um, a lot of people go from the, uh, from the Canaries to uh, the Caribbean. Um, so yeah, that's what makes my route unique. I'm going mainland to mainland, Europe to uh, North America, and I start this December. Yes, and I'm guessing it's the trade winds, isn't it? It's quite because they yeah. go clock, clockwise. Exactly, exactly that. Exactly that. So you know, um, it's all, it's funny. Uh, but people say, "Oh, you know, you, you're mad. You know, you're brave doing something that's no one's ever done before." And I said, "I oh, know. I'm just I'm smart. You know, because if you try and beat someone's record, if you have no wind, you know, or no assistance, no assistance from the elements." And they had, you know, 40 knot winds on their raft for two months. You, you're not going to be there. So, you know, smart, um, rather, I would think. But, yeah, that's exactly right. You know, it is um, weather dependent how quick. So that's why I've got quite a wide left and right of arc. So 90, anywhere between 90 to 140 days I'm planning for it to take. So tell us about um, being a, 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 an all-arms commander then, because we've had... Rusty Furman on the show, and I believe he was five nine, was he not? Um, yeah, so I was so exactly that. So uh, I'm guessing probably you've got a lot of Royal Marine followers. Um, so it's a little bit different. So obviously you join the you join the corps, and everyone in the Royal Marines is a commander, whether you're a chef or a driver or you know heavy weapons or you know an ML. But it's not like that. So I joined the engineers. And then once you finish your basic training, your combat engineer training, and then your trade training, you have the option to go, um, there's multiple options. So obviously commando, uh, P company, um, you can go like amphibious search, stuff like that. So lots of options. And my dad was uh, 
was five nine. You know, my godfather's were, so I didn't really have a choice. You know, I always remember thinking, like, you know, in dark days on the commando course, I was like, Jesus, how was he going to look me in the eye across the Christmas dinner table if I go back and I couldn't do something that he could do? So yeah, so um, I volunteered for that when I was past training, so I was about eighteen. Went down to Limpston, um, well, volunteered, volunteered originally, and you know, and always try and say because I'm, I now train phase two recruits. And um, I remember when I first volunteered, you know, I could do two pull-ups, couldn't climb the 30-meter rope, straight in the tank of the regain. I just about got round the bottom field because I was a whip. I was about 70 kilos, piss wet through. Oh, I mean, like four minutes, 58 or something. Um, but I went away, worked it for six months and yeah, and then ended up going down, passing passing first attempt. Um, and then I passed out in, uh, when was it? July? No, I think. July, August of 2012, and then joined 5-9 Commando. Spent seven and a half years with them um, and loved it. And yeah, and then now I've got post, uh, now I've been posted to um, our Phase 2 establishment. So a very brief history there, Chris, of my military yeah. career. I always like to ask people, what was your nemesis in the, when it came to the Commando tests? Yeah, so I wouldn't say I had a, I had a nemesis as such. Like I was, I was like I said, I trained because... I went on that fan visit, you know, when I was still sort of four, well, no, probably six months away from finishing my trade course. So, I, I, you know, I knew what I had to work on and I turned up quite, quite well prepared. Um, but the test I found the hardest um, was actually a 30 miler. And it's funny, I remember, um, I remember starting, you know, you do the first up at the crack of dawn, leave O'Campton, the first six miles, I was like, I've got, I've got this in the bag, you know. And then people always go, oh, what was the hardest bit of the 30 miler? And I always go, the last 24 miles. <laughs> I was in clip. <laughs> like, you know, but yeah, made it around really good. You know, my, uh, my godfather turned up tail. So it was really cool to see him as we come over the bridge and then had a pint and fell straight asleep, cramped up on the coach back to Limpston. And then oh, the yeah. worst, you've obviously got to put your cap comfort on and then run around camp, haven't you? Yes, there's no letting up. Jack, can I just say, can you try not to touch the table? Because it's... Oh it's coming over really loud and people on iTunes and that will just be like, Ooh, Oh yeah. Sorry. Can't, mate, sorry. can't listen to it. <laughs> that better. Yeah. That, it, it's, um, mate, I've done this a while now and it's, um, you, you, I learned to rein in all my bad habits. Touching oh, I'm stuff. so mate. I'm so like hands <laughs> everywhere. Do you know what I mean? I'm a nightmare. Sorry. Yeah. Yes. And, um, was it your first time in Plymouth or, or had you been there before? No. So, so we've, we five nine have moved from Plymouth. We're now based um, with CLR up in Barnstable. Oh, uh, bad luck. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's nice in the summer, obviously, you know, with the beaches and the surf and that, but in the winter, it's bloody grim. Um, but no, yeah. Uh, so I got posted there seven and a half years, you know, did all the brigade deployments, um, you know, Norway's, America's, Scotland's, maybe not as good, um, Albania's. Yeah, so it was really, really good time. Really enjoyed myself. I like it. You got um, some telemark skis behind you. Yeah, I was wondering if you'd clock them. Yeah, so we've got a little um, uh, command. Oh, it's actually, it's actually the shelf for you. Yeah, yeah, it's actually the ah. shelf. Oh, that's um, a first. Yeah, pretty cool, does, huh? Does that mean when the snow comes, you have to take all your drinks off and... <laughs> well, to be fair, we, we used to have them just loose in the bar. We used to like try and put them on, like ski down the stairs, like obviously tanked up and that. And then Smudge was like, let's put these to good use and stop someone breaking a bloody ankle. Um, They're actually really good skis. We, we called them Pusser's Planks, which is a bit, planks, of a, yeah. a bit of a slur. But to be honest, um, you know, they're not like obviously racing skis, but for robust. For what, robust. For, they've, got, yeah. they've got new ones now. Have they really? Yeah, I've got new ones. Yeah, I, I hear they're um, they're better, but I haven't had the pleasure of trying them out yet. Oh, just I love cross country. I um, I want to plan a trip. One of my next adventures or upcoming adventures to just ski somewhere and and you know have my tent and everything like like yeah. you do in Norway and and just I don't know across Greenland or maybe um. Maybe just go to the north of Norway and ski down to Oslo or something. Yeah, um, it's just it's, it's just incredible. incredible. Yeah, it's epic. It's epic. I was going to say, have you heard about that race in Switzerland? Um, it's a mad ski race. 
that they do over the mountains. That's that looks quite punchy. It's not what probably what you're looking for because it's over sort of like three or four days and then it's done. Or it yeah. might be shorter, but yeah, it's but it's pretty epic. I consider anything. There's one in Sweden. It's called the. All Swedish people listen. Forgive my pronunciation, but it's something like the Vasaloppet. Vasaloppet. Um, and it's uh, it's. I think it's done in a day, and it's over a hundred miles or something. But of course, because of all this, I and I put in for it, or I was yeah. just about to put in for it, and then of course all this stuff happened, and um, that was that was game over. Yeah, it's been a bit of crap, sort of. But we seem to be coming out sort of the back of it now, which is good. But it's been a really, you know, crap eighteen months, isn't it? You know. Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't hold your breath, mate. There'll be more of this to come. Yeah, well, um, fingers crossed. People are not broken down enough yet, and yeah. not enough people have committed suicide and lost their whole whole livelihoods, and and yet people are still going to support it because. They do the one thing I ask my subs not to, which is watch mainstream media. Yeah. Till you turn that shit off, you, you're never going to blossom in your life, you know? Yeah, no, I, I do. You know, I'm not. I don't think we need to go down the COVID rabbit hole. Um, but certainly, because another thing as well, Chris, I bet you, are you sick of talking about it? Um. <sighs> Let's just say, as far as the podcast goes, I always ask my guests, just let's not go there, simply yeah, yeah, because yeah. everyone comes on so upset. Yeah. Instead of talking about their wonderful bought the T-shirt life story, yeah, they yeah, end yeah. up, you know, trying to make sense of the world. Um, I'm involved. I don't, I won't talk too much about it, but I'm involved with a wonderful group of veterans now who who are questioning like what happened to the freedom that our buddies died for yeah, yeah. what happened to the freedom that all those bloody teenagers in the first world war went over the top and got sliced down by machine gun fire you know we they died for freedom freedom of choice freedom of information yeah freedom over your your own body and all of that it's just been handed away. Yeah. And as far as this, the veterans, it's unacceptable. It's yeah. just, it's just unacceptable. Um, but let's, let's get back to your wonderful story. Yeah. Otherwise we're going to get kicked, kicked off some of the platforms that we're yeah. on. You know, there's a clue there in itself, isn't it? If you can't talk about stuff, then, uh, you know, it raises a red flag, but yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, why you did some rowing in the military, and I heard you were quite good at it. Yeah. I mean, quite good, Chris, is maybe generous. I'm, I'd like to describe myself as a bit of an erg monkey. So, not much technique, but just a lot of uh, brute mong strength, I like to call it. Um, but, yeah, did pretty well. So, I think it was in 2019. Um, Two four, so we won the indoor rowing league. Um, so really, really good achievement. You know, again, I'm not sure if it was down to finesse, you know, skill, technique, maybe just good group of lads getting after it. Um, you know, so did that, and then uh, one of my friends, Duncan Roy, um, he got MD'd from the military uh, with an knee injury, and he went and rode the Atlantic, and he came back to our unit, and he gave a brief, Chris. And you know, when you just hear someone speak and you're just like, wow. And it instantly, it was just like that light bulb moment, something clicked and I was inspired, you know, I was like, right, I need to do something like this. Um, so, you know, got in, so start putting the feelers out, um, you know, found about the Ocean Rowing Society, a guy called Chris Martin, not the lead singer of Coldplay, um, just to clear that up and uh, sort of come in and came about with this idea and you know, started planning and it, and it's sort of, it's Chris, it's something like this, these expeditions that you plan are so far away from like the instant gratification um, that we're so accustomed to now. I always say, you know, we're that lazy now, or, you know, 10, 15 years ago, you had to get off your ass, go to your kitchen drawer and get your takeaway menu. Like now you don't even have to bloody 
you know, you don't even have to get off the sofa because it's, it's in your hand. Um, so, I yeah. remember, mate, I remember the days you actually had to freaking cook food. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, so it's so far away from that. And, um, and then, so that's, you know, what inspired me to do, to, why ocean rowing? Um, and then, you know, sort of then another reason was like, well, I'm going to do this. For, you know, I love, I want to raise some money for charity because I ran the new forest marathon again in, was it the back end of 2019? I think it was back in 2019. And, and uh, people begrudged. I was raising money for brain tumor research. Charity really close to my heart because my granddad passed away with brain tumor. Mm. And people were like, yeah, but chat, why should we give you, you know, 20 quid? We know you can, you know, run a marathon. And I remember thinking, I was like, like, hang on a minute, hang on a minute. Um, it's not going in my skyrocket, do you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's going to the charity. So that's why then the row developed. I was like, right, if I row the Atlantic and then not only do something that's never been done before, no one can go, you took the easy route, you know. And again, I love that, you know, that dogged, tenacious, you know, pick the hard way. You know, don't, you know, don't take the easy route. F- find the hard way and, you know, earn it through grind and and determination i'll tell you an interesting thing um i was on ship for a, for a year had a wonderful experience of being on a of 12 marines on an aircraft carrier and we did a charity row in the middle of the atlantic or the might have been the mediterranean or something right they just got the row machines up on the deck and it was bootnecks against the matlows against the airmen or something yeah. like this and um I got on that thing. I, I've never been particularly fit. You know, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll get by, you know. Yeah. But of course, I'm up against these and I can't, we can't lose. So I'm on this machine and I, I don't know, it was maybe just a mile or something we had to yeah. row. It, 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 it wasn't a lot. And I just gave it my all. And afterwards, I had a, what you could describe as a funny turn. Yeah. I started to feel really strange. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, I've run a hundred miles nonstop. I've run 200 miles in six days. I've run a thousand miles the length of the country sleeping at the side of the road. And none of that. Yeah. Different, in- different intensity though, Chris, you know, when you get on that erg and you, you know, you really throw down, like it's this, it's the sky. Like, just falling off it you know like and that's the thing that my row will be sort of away from that two uh, two minute 2k best effort you know it'd be more like what you're saying you know those big 100 mile races you know um you know a real i described a planning of this like a grind you know having yeah. meetings you know dead ends that go nowhere and you know or, or like this if I, I had a message as such a little bit corny but you know good things are hard to come, like, you know, they don't come easy. And, uh, you know, you've got to work for them, you've got to get after them. But then, you know, the harder the battle, the sweeter the victory, they say. Yes. So, you know, it's, you know, it'd be yeah. like those runs, it'd be more more of a grind. Yeah, those runs are just, you just keep cracking on at it. This bloody little row, I went to my bunk bed and I crawled in it and I was in there for, for two two days. I couldn't get out of it just for a mile row. I was absolutely, yeah. I was feeling sick, nauseous. Yeah. Just, you know, just absolute. It was the most I think I've ever pushed myself. Yeah. Did you win though? Nah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not I even worth the, it. I think the Stokers won or something. I don't know. I may, maybe we maybe, maybe, maybe we did. My yeah. claim to fame is that um, we had an intership football match. So I represented the Royal Marines. Yeah. And so my claim to fame is, is that I represent the Royal Marines at football. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Bit of a stretch. Yeah, you've got to sell it, you know. Like, before I joined the army, I was an underwater ceramic technician. I just used to wash up plates in a pub, you know. Like, <laughs> just to have how you, how you package it, mate. How you package it. Another little one that I pulled is, um, I was on the, I, I did actually fly fish for the Royal Marines. I was on the Royal Marines fly fishing team. But, of course... There's only like 10 fly fishes in, in the whole of the court. That was a lovely little number. We got to go away, these beautiful locks up in Scotland and just fish for a couple of days. 
that still never really caught <laughs> caught many. But See, this is this is the thing, and you know, when I, I talk about them, you know, the military and in you know whether it is you know the corps or the army or the navy or you know, God forbid, the RAF. Um, you know, so many opportunities out there. Like you know, you don't realise how oh, lucky. You are. You know, some of the opportunities I've had, like going doing biathlon skiing for six weeks, full pay. And because I was obviously representing my unit, we we're on LSA, LOA. And, you know, none of my civvy mates have done that. Do you know what I mean? And, and like you said, go and fly fishing, like on a, you know, Wednesday afternoon. You don't get that if you're, you know, a bricklayer on site, do you? Do you know what I mean? No. You know, the opportunities are amazing. And, you know, I was lucky. It's always funny, like a lot of my peer group here, not so much in a commando wing very similar to me but they're like oh you know been to kenya and canada and i've never been to kenya and canada because free commander brigade don't go there and i want i tell them i've been you know six months in the caribbean doing hurricane disaster relief you know on ship norway and all this and they're like wow that's mad you know so we and then as well i was really lucky although i never went to on a herrick because i joined up too late um, it was all over by the time i was you know 16 and joining the army i went to the philippines in 2013 after typhoon Haiyan, and that was you know a really like cool experience for what i would have been what 19 20 mm. yeah really good really good yes yes had a trip to the philippines once fell in love actually that was uh easily done out there uh, mate easily yes. done <laughs> Yeah, I got an indulgence flight to Canada once and then I couldn't... I thought you were going to say you got an indulgence massage. I was like, all right, Chris, is that how this, uh, this podcast is going? I would never have one of those <laughs> in Bangkok and yeah, yeah. Germany and... <laughs> Kareem's, mate. <laughs> yeah, I got an indulgence flight to Canada, so I paid like 40 quid. I had a, just the time of my life over there for three weeks, just met my mate's family, met a load of party goers and they looked after me. Um, and then I couldn't get an indulgence flight back. Yeah. So I had to stay another three weeks and I, I phoned up my, my work and for our friends at home, big no, no to be absent without leave. It's yeah, yeah, basically yeah. You, you go to prison in the, yeah. in the military. And I phoned at work and um, one of the corporals answered and I'm like, John, it's Chris. I'm stuck in Canada, mate. I, could, I can't, you know, if I pay for a civvy flight, it's like 800 quid to get back or something. Yeah. He went, mate, don't worry. Probably sergeant's away for three weeks. Take take your time. I'm like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Such a prof sometimes, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. So, um, yes, Brain tumour. Funnily enough, the 100 miler I did uh, for my birthday weekend was to raise money for a little girl who's recovering from a brain tumour. Um, so you've got the motivation there. You're also raising awareness of suicide. Yes. Which is, you know, so, gosh. Yeah. So, Chris, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about my charity. So first one is, is Brains Trust, which is a brain tumour charity based on the Isle of Wight, so not far from me. And they do some brilliant things for, you know, um, uh, for people, you know, families, people affected by brain tumours, you know, help, advice and things like that. Um, and like I said, my granddad passed away with a brain tumour in 2007. And I didn't know this, obviously, um, at the time, but brain tumours uh, kill more people under the age of 40 than any other cancer, yet only receive less than 1% of national cancer research funding. Mm. Um, so yeah, that's, that's why I picked that charity, you know, doing some brilliant things. And then the second charity is Calm, the campaign against living miserably. And it was, while I was away on ship, I got quite friendly with one of the, um, with one of the Navy guys called, called Mason. Now he was captain of the Navy rugby team. So, you know, you know, played at Twickenham, very prestigious, you know, honor. Uh, You'd walk into a room and you'd hear him, mate, who's like big prop, but didn't look, you know, I'm sorry, didn't act like how he looked, like really friendly guy, you know, really nice guy. And then unfortunately, he took his own life. And I remember thinking at the time, I was like, he is the, the, like the stereotypical classic, someone you say, I never thought he would do it. 
and it really just showed, you know, you don't, you don't know what people's going through and, and Calm do some brilliant things. They have a 24-7, 365 day a year helpline that you can, you can phone if you're going through a difficult time. So, yeah, and, and also, you know, especially being in the military and, and you know, we lo- know a lot of guys that are, you know, going through that hard time as well. So that, that's why I picked, I picked Calm. Yes, brilliant, mate. Absolutely, absolutely brilliant. You know, and you, you're never going to know how many lives that you save uh, off the back of this. And yeah, full credit to you. No, cheers. Thank you very much. And I, I always, you know, you talk about inspiration and, and things like that, you know, and people go, oh, how can you, how can you do that? And I'm like, all you, I say all I've got to do, I'm, I'm aware it's going to be a, the, this monumental challenge it's going to be really difficult on some, on some dark days but you know look at my granddad you know battle of brain shooting for like three years you know you know people you know lose their job you know like might break up with their missus got like two kids to like or might break up with their you know husband you know two kids to feed you know think of the stress you know that they're going through in life and you know and that's what I want to try and do you know show that and we all go through our times but you know if you you know you can't just let them take over. You can't, you know, you've got to work. It's not easy, but you've got to fight. You've got to be determined. You've got to be tenacious. And, and if you are those things, if you show those qualities, you will get through it, you know? Yeah, and also, like, being mid-Atlantic, rowing along with the sun on your face, I, I know you're going to get the, the big waves and stuff, but you're listening to a podcast or you're listening yeah. to some banging tunes and you're just high on life. Like, why would you not choose that over working in a nine to five in a job that you hate? Exactly, mate. Killing your life, just looking forward to the weekend. When the weekend comes, all you do is get pissed and have hangover all day Sunday and feel shit. Yeah. You know, working for a boss that, that, let's be honest, he hasn't really got, or she hasn't got your best interests at heart. This it's a no-brainer, is it not? Yeah, no, that, exactly. And you know, people would say, you know, why? And I was like, because as much as I love, you know, I do enjoy my job, but I wanted something more. I wanted that fulfilment. I wanted that adventure. Mm. And I'm not, I'm not saying, you know, again, Chris, like it's all about, you know, levels as such. You know, I'm not saying, you know, maybe a 40 year old man or woman who's you know, doesn't run, not into their fears, should today, tomorrow go out and say, right, I'm going to row the Atlantic, you know, but have a goal in life, you know, that that's, that's you know, had this goal and now I'm, you know, going to achieve it. You know, it's, it might be for that 40-year-old man or woman to run a 10K and then once you've done that 10K, right, think, what's next? Well, a half marathon and then a marathon, you know. Um, you know, it's about going out and getting, because that fulfilment you get from doing something like that is better than, you know, 10, I mean, don't get me wrong, I love me pints as well, as much as the next bloke. And I'm sure we'll talk about uh, that later. But, you know, it is, you know, that feel, that feeling of when you do, you do, like, you know, run a, like as I've run a marathon. I'll tell you what, I felt better after it than when I've had an absolute skimful and taken some, you know, mm-hmm. little slosh puppy home, you know what I mean? Yes, so, of course. So let's talk about how do you get this together? Obviously, I'm guessing your first focus is getting a boat. Yeah, so good question, Chris. So when I decided, right, I'm going to row the Atlantic, you know, there's not a, maybe I should do this, actually, release a book, How to Row the Atlantic, you know. Um, in fact, yeah, I'm going to have that. All right, copyright here. Okay, you heard it. Um, yeah, you know, so you, what you do is you just sort of, so I was lucky I had a, a good friend in Duncan Roy um, who'd rowed two, two oceans. When I decided uh, I was going to do it. So I obviously spoke to him and then you speak to more people um, about getting, you know, about their experiences. And then, you know, it's the sort of power of social media. You know, you start a, you start a, a, an Instagram and a Twitter page, United We Conquer, everyone give me a follow. Um, you know, you start, you start that um, and it sort of builds momentum and you approach sponsors and it's really tough, mate. And like I said, it's a grind and you have to have that, dogged determination because Chris I can't tell you how many people how many meetings I've had phone calls I've made of people you know like bullshit like oh yeah yeah well interested mate definitely do something for you give me a call tomorrow 
and then you call on tomorrow and then they've obviously blocked your number or they just don't answer, you know. And I remember one meeting, guy, you know, give them the pitch and he's gone, you know. Now I'm listening to him chat shit because it was shit. <laughs> um, and he's like, you know, Jack, I've had the first cars, had the women, had the watches, had the, you know, flash villas. I was like, all oh, right, yeah, nice. He's like, you know, had the cocaine parties. I'm like, Jesus, this guy's bloody Wolf of Wall Street, isn't it? <laughs> and I was like, you know, you know, could you do, could you do five grand, you know, one of our lower sponsors? And he's like, look, mate, don't know if we're, we're there yet. Do you know, I've, I've been a tough year. I had to let a few people go. And I was just like, hang on, you've just been making out that you're bloody Hugh Hefner at the Playboy Mansions. Like, you're not hardly short of a penny, are you? So, yeah, you know, it's really tough. Um, but then, you know, I had some great sponsors come on board. Um like a dive services, you know, through my personal connection. So the guy that X59 at Dan Tennant, he come on board. Um, Sean Crawford dropped so much on um, where it's a day. He come on board, Rose and Partners, Finch Bakery, Nifty, um, you know, Saab, GW Rail Freight, you know, some real, you know, you can't, um, that's another thing I'd say to anyone who wants to row an ocean. Don't think, because everyone always goes, have you, have you approached Red Bull? Like my nan blesses you. I know she's like, you know, you should get in touch with Amazon and I was like yeah I'll just I'll just get on the customer service line and say yeah uh, Jeff Bezos there yeah sweet I need 100 grand because that's how much it roughly costs or anywhere between sort of 70 and 100 grand um, but yeah you know like I said Finch Bakery you know a bakery just in Lancashire that two of my friends own lovely girls um, Lauren and Rachel um, and then yeah they gave us you know like 3,000 pounds you know and that's amazing, you know, it's like so amazing. And the big thing as well, it's obviously the financial support is massive, Chris, mm. but it's the, it's, the, it's the thought that they believe in you, that they're going to give you their cold, hard cash. That's where I draw more inspiration from. I'm like, wow, like, obviously I believe in myself, but for someone else to believe in me, that's one of the big things, you know, and I've, I've maybe not struggled with that, but sometimes like through my life thought, Oh, everyone, no one thinks I can do it and stuff like this, you know. Um, so yeah, so you get the money together, and I put fifteen grand of my own money in, and then then I had a boat, and then you know you approach companies to hopefully buy some food, and uh, my mate's fencing company, Beelon Fencing, gave us like a thousand pounds to buy me one hundred and forty five freeze dried meals, and then next thing you know, you sat, you know, opposite you, Chris, you know, chatting about it. So yeah, that's sort of how, that's sort of how you do it. There's no hard and fast rule like. Um, some companies come on and sponsor, you know, 100 grand and, and ask them. They cover the whole expedition costs. But then me, I've got lots of little sponsors. I ran raffles, um, you know, raffle. Thank big shout out to James Ward Prowse, by the way. He um, donated a match worn shirt and the whole Southampton Football Club signed it. So raffled that. Um, cheers for everyone that bought a ticket. So, yeah, there's no hard and fast rule. You just got to sort of adapt and, you know, be flexible and, and just think of new ways, you know, hosted a few piss ups as well, you know, um, which are always good fun. Um, that's so yeah, do it. yeah. So that's sort of how I, how I've got to this position. Um, so are you, Jack, are you, are you buying, a, let's call it a second hand boat or are you having one designed for you? No, no. So, um, so I bought a second hand. You can, you can have one obviously built new that costs more. So I bought mine second hand, so it's on one crossing. Um, and I, re- I named it after my granddad, Budgie. Um, people say it's, you know, bad luck to um, rename a boat, but I don't believe in that. You know, I believe in you make your own luck. Um, and I thought, you know, what a nice touch, me and my granddad together for one last ride across the Atlantic. So, yeah, um, the Budgie, look out for me. Um, you'll be able to track me through, a, through an app um, through called YB Races. They've been really good as well. Shout out to them. Um, they're going to trap me and, and host me on their app for absolutely nothing. So big shout out to um, Rachel. Um, so yeah, you know, you'll be able to, you'll be able to trap me in my little, my little seven meter boat. Gosh. Yeah. And so food wise, you, you mentioned dried rations. Yeah. Um, so Chris, you know what you take to Norway? Mm. It's exactly them, you know, and um, for people that don't know what Norway rations are, it's effectively a pot noodle, um, you know, just a little bit more nutritional value in. Um, so, yeah, they do loads. Of my, funny, my grandma was like, because a lot of them are curry, um, I think, 
because of the rice, you can get the calories in with the rice and, and the curry sauce probably actually, let's not beat around the bush. Um, she was like, curry in the mid-Atlantic? She was like, Jack, you know, will you not be, you know, pooing all the time? And I was like, I was like, I might be grandma, but I think I need the rice content and the curry sauce to get the calories up. So yeah, a lot of curries, but um, as well, mate, they've come on probably so much since, you know, even the military rations have come on so much. So you can imagine what they're like in the sort of civilian yeah. world. Really good, mate. Um, you know, a re- real term at reindeer stew, you know, I, I'd be happy if someone served that me in a restaurant. It's delightful. Um, I'm going to have that on Christmas, you know, reindeer, festive. Have you used um, MREs, the, these ones that you heat up? American ones. Yeah, so they, they, have, um, they have them now in, in some of the English Russian uh, rations. Yeah, they're, they're, they're quite good. Yeah, I've, I've the problem tried. With rations is they're, they're heavier and they don't have the, the calorie content of um, dry rations. Yeah, I very kindly, one of our supporters, Barry, hello, Barry, if you're out there, he sent me quite a few boxes of various ration packs. And one was the American MREs and one was the British. It's quite funny, really. I look at it, it freaking makes me feel sick just looking at all the sugary drinks. And I don't mind stuff like processed cheese and and savory stuff yeah but even when i'm doing like endurance stuff i never go really I, I, you're never going to see me drinking lucas aid or something so, like um another shameless plug here but have you tried um you know built on beef jerky so an x again x59 um built on beef he hun- uh donated you know a, f- a few bags of built on he's going to do the same again um for the row and mate it's lovely. Do you know what I mean? Like it's, oh. I'm a bit like you. I like, I'm not as, sorry, I'm not as, as anti sweet as you, you know, I like a mix, but I, I like my savory stuff as well. Chris, so good, mate. You know? Yeah, I bet. And as well, the good, the good thing with like built on is you chew it. But it's quite tough. Obviously it lasts a lot longer. So you feel like you're getting more bang for your buck rather than, you know, just a little square of chocolate that you chew once, then you swallow. Um, so yeah, there's my recommendation, mate, on your next hundred miler. Yes, yes. When I do my runs and stuff, I just eat whatever I feel like eating. At home, I'm, I try to be more plant-based. So I, I, my girlfriend buys me this um, vegan jerky, which is actually really nice, you know. Is it from Aldi? Yeah, that's the Yeah, yeah, I've, I've tried some of that. It's good. Do you yeah. know what, Chris, do you know my favourite thing about vegan food, right? I'm, I'm, you know, not vegan, but I love eating vegan food because it really winds people up the wrong way that are vegan. I'm like, they're like, well, why wouldn't you just have meat? I was like, well, why wouldn't you just have something plant-based? And they're like, it's yeah, really but- simple, folks, yeah. if you listen. You can't be a legend and eat meat. You just can't. <laughs> you, you, you'll live a mediocre life. Look, the, the, the world's strongest men, I'm not talking like the steroid guys. I, I mean, yeah. the genuinely, they're all plant-based. The world's best, fastest ultra runners they're plant-based the world's smartest thinkers they're pl- and i'm not I, I don't have any like strict rules with my life if i want to go and i, I mean I, the hundred mile run i did the other day I had lobster halfway through because you can't get that where i live hang on so, hang on all right you're doing a 100 mile race yeah. and you have lobster yeah i stopped at this pub all oh, right okay yeah, yeah. i got well, like I got the menu out. Like nutter. <laughs> I, I tell you what, it was absolutely gorgeous. I had yeah. f- five cups of tea, a pint of limeade, a bottle of soul, and that's another thing. You know, I try not to drink much these days, but when I'm on a run, I, I just do what you feel like, whatever I feel right. But um, yeah, we need. I'm only saying this for our young people listening. When you hear people slagging off people that eat plant based, it's it's don't don't be that person yeah just all a, you're saying is is that you you don't know a lot about life yes yeah. you know the human body we thrive on plants that's that's yeah. that's what yeah, I, see i'm not as you know i'm you know i do eat you know me i'm not complete but I, I love some you know plant-based food and as well like i'm a you know like you know i like the environment needs to look after it you can't have meat bloody every day you know it's just non-sustainable um you know, if you and I always look back, you know, when we're sort of hunter gatherers, having meat was a treat, was you know, 
yeah. was a very big treat. So, you know, I like them as well. Some of the plant-based products now, it, you know, if people, people say, yeah, but I love meat, you should try them because some of them, you know, those substitutes are really close. But then once you've gotten into that, you know, you can try some things that, you know, aren't so. And I'll send you the recipe, mate, Chris, after this for a chickpea. Mm -hmm. uh, I learned, I had such a funny story, actually. So I was, I was trying to, my missus isn't there. So I was trying to, this was a few years ago before I was met her. I was trying to fire into this uh, vegan, vegan young lady. And uh, she was like, yeah, you, you, do you eat me? And I was like, nah, nah. And she was like, oh, what's your go-to dish? And I was like, oh, like just, Chickpea, chickpea curry. Uh, she was like, "Oh yeah, yeah, send us the recipe." Um, and I was like, "Yeah, well, I'm making it tonight." You know, in that word vomit sort of. She was like, "Oh, awesome! Like, make sure you send me a picture." And I was like, "Bollocks!" So I was like, quickly chickpea curry. Found it. It was, it was actually really good. But now it's like my, you know, a signature dish. She was like, "Oh my god, that looks amazing! You'll have to make it for me." And I was like, "Yeah, make it all the time. No dramas." <laughs> yes, it's um. I, I try and explain this a lot in my life coaching, but but you, our bodies vibrate at a certain frequency in, in tune with what they're supposed to in the grander universe. And, and it's called the Kundalini effect. It means you, you literally live every day on, on a high. So yeah. you don't have any mental health issues, any goal you choose, you just get out and smash it. Yeah. Da, 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 da. Too much meat just creates too much acid in your body's tissues. Yeah. And that, that in itself is a bit like drinking alcohol. You know, the next day, you just can't help but feel shit. You know, yeah. you just can't help. And meat is a similar thing on a, on a much smaller level. But your body, it stops your, your, this all-important vibration. And so um, this isn't, although, you know, it is about the animals in, in a you know, factory farm and it's just bloody despicable when you think about it mm. um but for me it's not so much that although that is important it's more like you get one life and i i just want to smash every goal that i i mean i want to row the atlantic absolutely and 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 you know that's that's definitely a a, a, a plan for me and yeah if so I, if um, to, chris if you want to row the atlantic i know i have no doubt that you could do it you just and this is this is the thing you just need to set yourself a date and say, right, I'm going to do it on this date. Um, and if you're worried about, you know, because obviously I bought, um, you know, because ocean run boats are like cars, you know, you can get ones, that are, you know, really fine tuned, carbon, light, you know, you can get slight. So, you know, it doesn't need to be this massive expensive thing, but just, you just got to be rigid and set a date and say, right, I'm going to row the Atlantic on this, this year at the end of, 2024 and then once you've said it you know you've got a date and you can start approaching sponsors you know and, and don't be disarmed because it's not easy i'm telling you now it hasn't been easy it's been a slog you know it's been, it feels oh, like I've been talking about what i've been thinking about um for the past 18 months two years um you know but i'm here now and, and now I've, and then all of a sudden chris you'll have a boat and you'll be like all oh, right i'm bloody doing it um so yeah, mate, I'll definitely, I'll definitely say, do it and just, just, just be rigid and just say, cause if, cause if you say, oh, I'm, I'm going to do it, you'll never do it. You know? Yeah. For me, it's more a case of like, I asked my mate the other day, Mike, hello, Mike, if you're, he's a, you know, he's done some adventurous stuff. I said, mate, would you row the Atlantic with me? And, and he said, Chris, I'm a dad. I'm not being, you know, I'm not going to put my life at risk. I said, mate, it's, Yes, there are dangers, but it's not statistically, it's not really the most dangerous. You know, the boats yeah. are so safety wise these days. And as long as you've done your training, you follow your procedures and you, and you don't do stuff stupid like people say that to me, you know, it's dangerous. I was like, well, if, if you're always lanyarded to the boat, you'll never become separated. The boats are designed not to sink. Um, as long as you keep your hatches closed, which your hatches should always be closed unless you're transiting through them. Um, so, you know, I, it's, it's dangerous if you're unprepared, you know, and you go in half cocked, if you're well prepared, well drilled, you should be fine. Obviously there are, there's the risk of something catastrophic happening, but that is, you know, normally that's something out of your control, you know, like a rogue wave or something when like I, that. When I was chatting to Lee Spencer, he, 
you know, I said, did, did it get hairy? And he's like, yeah. I mean, he had 40 foot waves or something for three nights. Yeah. And he, and he's on his own and Lee's got one leg. Not, not that that bloody stops him doing anything, but yeah. Um, and it's kind of in the back of my mind. I, I don't know if he'd, if I'd want that experience alone, Yeah. whether I'd want to be with a mate. So it's least it's like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I certainly want, want to put my life in jeopardy because I'm a father and that would just be, Cruel, cruel, you know. My yeah. my son's really young, um. So yeah, that's the thing. I, I um just watched Matthew Pritchard. Um, I follow him on Instagram. He's yeah, he was on the Monkey Fist too. Yeah, I don't know what. Uh, I, I just remember seeing the videos that they were putting on Instagram, and he's a bit of a legend of mine. You know, I, I, yeah. I really like Matt. I want, want to get him on the show. Um. And um because he's because he's plant based now, isn't he? And yeah, and doesn't drink at yeah. all. He's plant based, and again, folks, if you're listening, he he he'll he'll do ten Iron Men in one go. Ten. Yeah. Most people a lifetime dream to do a half marathon, maybe a marathon tops. Iron Man, it's a very limited few. Now this guy does ten in a row non-stop basically um and yeah and and plant-based he's just a great just a great great example um and um for anyone sorry to put a bit of context matt was in the show dirty sanchez uh, dirty sanchez which was all about sex drugs and rock and roll and shoving spikes through your cheek and nailing your balls to the table and and all these extreme stunts right off the back of their their sort of skateboarding careers um and i think like a lot of us you know he's getting a bit older and wiser yeah wiser but probably more sensible and that that reflects in you know you 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 leave the party stuff behind and you start to seek more fulfilling pleasures and and sort of more challenging ones i suppose but when i looked at the footage they sent and i think it was three of them might have been four but well i think it was four four yeah they they were just having a ball the whole time and the wet the sea just seemed calm the weather was and i guess you can have two different experiences can you not yeah definitely and i definitely think that's something that's happened more recently so teams are more more prepared you know more professional and and this isn't me you know slating anyone that did it 10 15 20 years ago but the kit's gotten better the boats have gotten better you know like everything has um so yeah teams are definitely more prepared than they were one sec have we got a a grass mower outside i'm just going to shut the window We'll edit that out. Edit that out. <laughs> I can't work with these amateurs. Uh, um, yeah, sorry. So what was then? People we're, are we're, talk, we're talking about, like, can you have an easy run of it with nice weather and calm sea? Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and obviously the weather helps. But having said that, you know, if calm weathers and, and, and uh, you know, no wind, for instance, means a slower crossing. You know, my boat will be a sort of near in a ton by the time well, when I leave Portugal. Um, no. So it's a it's a lot of lot of boat to move with no wind. So if you've got um, uh, if what's the back of the boat? The aft end, called, the the stern, stern. The you got the bow and the stern. Am I, is that the right terminology? So, sorry. Um, you got the front of the boat. That's the prow or the bow. Yeah, wind, wind on your aft, your stern. Stern, yeah. yeah. Sorry for a marine. I should get that bit right. Nice, no, right. folks. <laughs> so, if you've got the wind on your stern, obviously it's pushing you along. Yes. Does that mean that they design these boats with a a big stern, or is that called cheating, or how does that work? No. So I think. There's a there's a general rule in the Ocean Rowing Society that the, the bow cabin can't be too big. Um, 
you know, but obviously some boats are designed to catch uh, more wind, you know, than others. But it comes down to a lot of things, you know, weight, like a lot of boats now are made out of carbon, um, which is obviously lighter than wood fiberglass. Not only that, it's the strength of the carbon. So whereas, a, you know, the, the strength of the boat won't bow as much in the, in the, you know, if you can gain, you know, an extra 50 meters, only a 50 meters a day, you add that up over 90 days, you know, it's, it's a lot. Um, what, if you, what if you hit a container, you know, these sunken, these semi-submerged containers that, that and they're, the sea's riddled with them apparently. Yeah. So that is something that sort of worries me, but um, again, Chris, that's out of my control. Yeah. So are, are, are the boats compartmentalized? So if one compartment breaks, it, the whole thing doesn't sink. Yes. Yeah, yeah, they are. They are. But that would be, um, I can imagine if I hit a container, container wrong, that would be quite catastrophic for the boat. But like I said, I've got a live raft at EPIRB. Um, so, you know, I would be able to be found. However, yes. again, you know, I can't, that, that is Chris, that is a really good example. That is something completely out of my control. Um, so there is no point me losing sleep, wasting my energy, because, you know, what am I going to achieve by worrying about that? Nothing. I can't, there's literally nothing I can do. What I can do, though, is control the controllables, you know, is be in the best physical condition that I can be for the start, you know, know my boat and be all over my skills and drills. Um, and, yeah, hopefully have a fast crossing and not encounter any cap, uh, cargo uh, containers. Do you have any sort of radar? So when you're sleeping, um, if you're in a shipping lane, well, obviously you're probably not going to sleep in a shipping lane, but, but you know, there are some big ships out there, right? Yeah, so I'll have um, my AIS on, which is effectively a radar, and then any ships that sort of come within um, two nautical miles of me, I'll, that'll start going off um, and will alert me, and then I'll be straight on the VHF saying, Oi, I'm here. Don't run me over, please. Yeah, be like that. Oi, that. Yeah, that, that, that way, please. That way. Yeah, 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 yeah. To a two um, million ton oil tanker. Yeah, yeah. It's funny. I so when um, obviously training the Solon, there's the deep water channel, and for people who don't know the, the Solon very well, there's I'm not sure how wide it is, but a channel which basically all the container ships go through, all the cruise ships, all the ferries that go from Southampton to the Isle of Wight. And they cannot deviate from that channel because it's the only place deep enough, obviously. And, um, you know, crossing that at night for your first time uh, is quite, is an experience, you know. Uh, you'll definitely be rowing fast when you see one of those 200 uh, tonne container ships bearing down on you. How, how long do you plan to sleep a day and what sort of shifts have you worked so out? My shift pattern will be wake up at around, five, uh, wake up around four, half four, some food, on the oars for five, three hours on, an hour off. Um, and then once it gets to midnight, come off the oars, again, have some food, refill the water bottles, all that sort of stuff, and then um, sleep and then re repeat for 90 days. So it, it works out about 15 hours rowing a day. Mm. Um, and then, yeah, uh, nine hours rest or whatever. And does that require a, a desalinator? For yes, you? yes, yes. I have a... Um, a pump that turns seawater into wine i mean drinking water uh, <laughs> and that that's um that's a really it's actually i was just about to say it's a really high tech piece of equipment but it's actually not there's about three moving parts to it um it's very yeah very surprisingly simple um i was surprised uh, but yeah so that'll that'll do but the one thing with that is it's it's one of the biggest power draws on your on the boat so you need to just be careful your power management you know this is another thing to think about you know especially if you get five five six seven days where it's overcast you know those solar panels aren't charging the batteries and um, you could end up hand pumping so i do have a backup um, um have a hand pump if if i can't use the electric one but the electric one does i think 30 liters an hour and the hand one does five liters an hour so you know which one you you want to be using, really. Yeah, of course. Lee pulled into the um, 
uh, what was it the um, was it the Canaries or something? It, it was somewhere on 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 route because he had a problem with his navigation, but he was allowed apparently allowed, even though he was unsupported, he was allowed to stop. I guess as long as he rode into port. Yeah, yeah. Is that is that is, does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Lee told me that. Um, yeah, that make makes sense. I'm, um, I think maybe. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't know really like the ins and outs, but I know he, he mentioned it. I think you are. I think you can as long as it's maybe safety, safety critical. Yeah. Um, and do you take a spare rudder with you? Did I understand that? Yes, yeah, I am taking a spare rudder um, with me because that's, you know, I'm trying to have on the boat nothing that would be a single point of failure, mm. um, you know, for obvious reasons. So you have that spare rudder. If, if the boat was to tip, capsize, and that was to snap, I'd be I'd be up, up, up shit creek without a rudder. So, um, yeah, taking a spare rudder. And what, what training do you have to do in terms of fitness and in terms of navigation and, and safety and stuff? So... You know, sort of what RYA sailing courses, you know, central seamanship and navigation, uh, radio, sea survival, that stuff. Also, my training in the gym has, has been planned by Gus Barton, um, you know, really good guy, rode, rode the Atlantic, rode around Britain. Um, so he's put me on a really good program, you know, training six days a week, nice and varied. I did a, a horrible session last night. So it was um, 10 rounds, 30 seconds on the assault bike, max chat, and then 90 seconds rest. That was um, certainly quite punchy. And then you've got all your on-water training as well. So trying to get up to around 150 hours, which, you know, there or thereabouts now. Um, so, yeah, feeling ready, feeling good, yeah. feeling uh, prepared. Do you, do you train... Have you trained in the boat? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, last, what was it, Monday, Monday night, went out for a 14-hour overnight row, started at 8 o'clock, uh, left Hamble all the way down to Hurst's Point, which is sort of the westerly tip of the Isle of Wight. Um, well, Hurst Point's on the mainland, but it's near the westerly tip of the Isle of Wight, and, and then rode back. So it's about 30 nautical miles in total, you know, really good. Uh, everything went to plan. Been down to Exmouth, uh, Exmouth to Torquay, uh, rode from Weymouth back to Southampton. So, you know, it's all about getting those hours in um, any way you can, really, because it's quite hard to go out as a solo, Chris, because you need the conditions, you know, because if you've got, you know, 30 knot winds coming from offshore, you know, you'll be blown onto the rocks, you know. And yeah. So you've, got, have, you've got to think about. Have you slept out yet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Slept out, uh, the other night. I um, only got like two and a half hours sleep because um, I had to wake up to get back in with the tide. Um, but yeah, slept on the boat. It's, it's quite comfy as well, mate. Once you've been rowing for six, seven hours, you're very ready to get your head down. Mm. I'm guessing when you sleep... You're on exercise, you know, and people say, how do you sleep in a sleeping bag at, you know, when it's pissing down the rain? You're like... Because when you've been patrolling for 20, 20 hours on an insertion... You know, you just get in that bag, and it's just like oh, you know, you're gone. Yeah. What are, do you take a sleeping bag, or do, well, yeah, a little jungle, jungle sleeping bag? Um, you know, take sort of pajamas. You know, just just some nice dry kit yeah. that when you you can come off, wet wipe yourself, clean jays, and have a nice yeah, have a nice sort of it, four hours. It, sleeping bag is that? I'm guessing polyester o over a down bag. Yeah, 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 yeah. A dam could get pretty miserable if it got wet. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 You know, you don't want to... Um, as well, well, although in my cabin, I do have like a nice wet, wet dry area. So you step in my cabin, like the wet area, D, D kit, and then you're away. Um, but yeah, you're right, down, piss wet down could uh, could get sad, very sad very quick. So Jack, we're going to put all your links underneath this video so where people can amazing thank you so much for that chris yeah i don't know actually if you want to make sure i've got everything just ping them to me um yeah definitely on, on, on what whatever i've only got what um how did you get your promoter is it sam sam yeah sam um sam right yeah he's so, doing um, a great job yeah he's a good guy um 
uh, Sam. So we met, he obviously works through like, works for Nifty, a company that Drop Zone introduced me to, Sean, Sean Crawford, and then really good lad. We're the same age as well, so we've got quite a lot in common. Um, just finally, you know, Chris, massive thank you for having me on, mate. I really appreciate it. And if you ever want to uh, chew the fat about, you know, ocean rowing, sort of not on the podcast forum, um, you know, you've probably got all my, well, you've got all my details, mate. Just drop me a line any time. Oh, mate, I feel like I've landed a bonanza to have uh, su- such a wealth of information that, yeah, yeah, that, no. that, that can support us. Yes. Thank you, mate. Really appreciate it. No, I appreciate you having me on the um, pod, mate, as well. Yes. And uh, as we always say, smash it. Yeah. Cheers, bud. Thank you very much. No worries. Just stay on the line so I can thank you properly, mate. Yeah, to yeah. everybody at home, I hope you found this as fascinating as I have. God, it just makes me want to do something with, with my life. Um, massive love to you all. If you could please just do the like and subscribe and the share thing, that's really going to help us. And we'll see you next time.